Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sarah Rosen Mortel with the great honor and, and pleasure of being the president of the Urban Institute and to thank you all for joining us. Uh, today's event is part of a series of discussions we're holding with leading change makers and urban analysts on questions emerging from the COVID-19 crisis and the long overdue reckoning with our nation's ongoing structural racism. I'm pleased to be joined by three great guests, but we have only about 30 minutes and lots to cover. So I'm gonna talk at the pace of a native New Yorker that I am. So first, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, we are recording the event and the recording and relevant links that we mentioned will be posted online after on the event page. All participants are muted. If you have questions or comments, put them in the questions box at any time. We don't have a lot of time to answer questions, but it's helpful for us and the panelists to see what you're thinking about and it'll both shape their answers and what we do in the future. And I encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter. Please use the hashtag live at urban so others uh, also online can see your posts. Today, we're talking about direct cash assistance, focusing on a new program here in DC, but acknowledging that this pandemic moment, when so many of our lowest wage and most economically vulnerable families saw their income evaporate overnight, is a unique opportunity to test and spread knowledge about direct cash assistance programs. And there are programs happening here, other programs happening here in this region and around the country. While Urban is a national research organization, that um, DC has been Urban's home for the past 50 years. We have strong roots here, deep partnerships with many communities. And so this event series is also going to, we're going to have a separate event series focused on DC. So I encourage you to keep an eye out for that and make sure you register for our event emails. The pandemic has caused a spike in unemployment and income loss that falls disproportionately hard on low-income individuals and as a result of systemic racism on black and brown communities. In DC's Ward 8, which is 92% black, low-income residents have felt these effects acutely. In response, four DC nonprofits, fabulous organizations, Martha's Table, Bread for the City, the 11th Street Bridge Park, and Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative, came together with local funders to stand up a direct cash payment and grocery assistance program for the residents. This program called Thrive East of the River has raised $4 million to give 500 families five months of support. We may need more, including weekly groceries, dry goods, and $1,100 in monthly financial assistance. They'll also provide assigned navigators who will help families access unemployment insurance, tax credits, and other available benefits. We're gonna to explore today the effects of the, how the pandemic's effects have fallen particularly hard on Ward 8 residents, what this program looks like, and how and what direct cash and food assistance can look like, not just in Ward 8, but in other programs as well. Our three guests include George Jones, CEO of Bread for the City, who's been there for 24 years, an organization that provides services to reduce the burden of poverty and uproot racism, and is one of the partners leading Thrive East of the River. We're also joined by Tanya Wellens, president of the Greater Washington Community Foundation, the largest public foundation in the Greater Washington region, and one of the funders of Thrive East of the River. Finally, we've got Urban's own Mary Bogle, who's a principal research associate here. She and her team have set up an evaluation of the Thrive Project's reach and effectiveness, and probably more importantly, will be providing real-time guidance for the nonprofit agencies to tailor their approach in response to the incoming data. So first of all, thank you all for being here and let's jump right in. So George, we're gonna start with you. And if you would, please, why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, so many of the residents in Ward 8 have been living for a long time with virtually no financial cushion, not even sometimes a month's expenses. And then COVID hit. So what are you hearing from the communities and families that you serve? Well, you know, we're hearing certainly from the folks that I've been able to talk to and I think from my staff, I'm hearing that as you can imagine, things are tougher than they've ever been. Uh, you know, food insecurity has spiked. Um, people have fallen behind on rent. And even though there have been some government sort of, um, you know, mitigation that's taking place around rents, people are really anxious about what that's going to mean. They're worried about the cliff when it comes time, when whatever the sort of uh, suspended sort of evictions and, and other um, legal uh, recourse that landlords have when that when that sort of ends, people are worried about that, and and, uh, and the truth of the matter is, people are worried about getting sick, and so in a lot of ways, uh, like many of us, they haven't been able to be as mobile to sort of address their own problems. 
But when you're living on low incomes, it's just exacerbated. And so many of us can call out for food or, you know, I know in our household, we use all kinds of remote ways to address our needs and our families just don't have that, those luxuries. Tonya, um, Tonya I'm sorry. Um, you seeing this impact all across the region, other observations? Oops, I'm sorry, M mute. We'll all, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Sarah. You know, to George's point, we knew pre-pandemic that one in five people in this region had already expressed, uh, experienced food and housing insecurity over the last 12 months, uh, and that lower wage workers were living further and further away from their place of employment because of the rising cost of, of housing. Um, we know that child care costs continue to be one of the biggest barriers to economic mobility. And so when the pandemic hit, it was hourly workers, uh, gig economy workers, restaurant workers, Uber drivers, home health aides, who were affected in a couple of ways. Either they were um, immediately laid off and um, had to sort themselves out with, uh, with some level of urgency, or they became our essential workers who have um, had to have the increased exposure to COVID-19. And we know that these are typically, uh, dis this is disproportionately black and brown workers who were filling uh, these roles already. And a healthcare system that often served them least well. Mary, Absolutely. other thoughts about the, what the data was telling us, um, how this landed in those communities? Mary, also mute, please. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know what, uh, there's been a um, distressing, uh, higher, distressingly higher rate of deaths in Ward 8 in particular. And as you uh, mentioned at the beginning of this, Sarah, there, you know, Ward 8 is 92% uh, African American Black residents. And so I think you can't um, discount that the roots of this really are systemic racism and historic racism that's gone on. These are very, Ward 8 neighborhoods all these Three River neighborhoods have been historically disinvested. Um, black residents were segregated there after the Great Migration, et cetera. So what we see now, the sorts of things, the, the, the lower wage jobs that the residents there hold, the stresses of economic hardship are creating health conditions. We think the social determinants of health issues are at play here. And then there is a lot of um, health access barriers j just because our public health system nationally and even locally uh, does not serve residents in these neighborhoods well. So um, I want to get to describing the program in, in a minute, but first I want to invite um, uh, both George and Tonya to speak to the question of the way that racial uh, structural racism has sort of mapped itself on our communities in our region. Uh, George, you want to go first? Yeah, I, I'll certainly go, you know, uh, Breath of the City has been focusing on uh, race equity and racial justice uh, for the last eight years, really intentionally. And what we know is uh, in communities of color, where Black people live in particular, that um, that it has been a long history of disenfranchisement around real estate and home ownership and access to affordable and quality housing, that we have food deserts disproportionately in those communities. The truth of the matter is, you name a social economic indice and people of color disproportionately are affected adversely. Uh, and this why organizations like Bread for the City and Martha Stable and uh, Boss, uh, Family Strengthening Collaborative and, and uh, BBAR exists is because we are there in a way to be kind of the band-aid to address the fact that systemically uh, these communities are oppressed economically. And, uh, and, and now that the COVID, uh, Mary sort of pointed out the most important thing. I, I always like to say that black people, brown people are dying disproportionately uh, because of this disease, but they were dying disproportionately because of poverty all along. Uh, and we need to remember that, that yes, the disease has highlighted that, but people, literally poverty is an issue of life and death and people have been dying disproportionately all along. And Antonia, in your leadership, new leadership of the Community Foundation, you've put these questions of racial equity at the center of its program. Just quick thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, COVID-19 has simply exposed uh, pre-existing inequities, uh, all rooted in systemic racism. Great. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the program we're talking about. So George, a little bit about how did it come together? Um, the, the part, how did the partners come together and sort of at its, at its most basic level, um, sort of what are you delivering and what are you trying to achieve? 
well, the, the partner came, partners came together right around the sort of just as the pandemic was hitting the East Coast, or at least we heard word of it. Uh, and we, you know, we decided that we wanted to, uh, that we knew that we needed to do something that would be a kind of an infusion of you know, real resources, resources that are most, that have the most level of flexibility, cash, to help families who were you know, already, again, in economic distress, who were going to be disproportionate. You know, one of the things about racial equity is that uh, leadership needs to know that you can predict what's going to happen in communities of color when you have adverse circumstances. They're going to be hit hardest. And so in a lot of ways, we were being responsive to that knowledge that if you have an economic downturn, if you have a disease like the COVID-19, it's going to hurt our communities more. And so these, and what we've seen in studies is that these uh, infusions of cash, these cash transfers have been really able to help families kind of get a little bit insulated from the harsh effect of, of downturns like this. And so we decided to create this initiative. The four partners came together, decided that we needed to raise roughly $4 million. And we wanted to transfer uh, $5,500 to 500 families. And to first and foremost, again, just to deal with the harsh impact of that we knew was going to come to this, this disease and this pandemic. But secondly, in hopes of really creating a kind of economic floor uh, that might be catalyst for people having a chance to, you know, lift their so own social economic status. We, studies have said that, that people do better when they have, you know, just enough cash to be able to solve some of the problems that programs themselves just can't get it. Even programs like Bread for the City, food and clothing and medical, that's fine if that's what you need. But what happens if you got to get your car repaired or if you need to you, you got to deal with a child care issue. And that was what we were trying to do is to give people the flexibility and the power to, to decide which are the real critical issues you need to address during this very difficult time. Tonya, I'm going to ask you in just a second, but first quickly, Mary, what is Urban's role in this initiative as one of the partners with the four service organizations? You know, as you alluded to early on, um, Sarah, Urban has uh, two things we're doing. We're doing a, you know, producing rapid response feedback loop so that all the partners can course correct in real time as this goes on. And we're also producing an implementation and outcomes findings on the project. Um, in the end, we intend to uh, disseminate an adaptable blueprint for how to forge alliances among key partners. And when there's a moment, I'd love to mention all four key partners in this and tell you a little bit about what we've documented in terms of their roles. That's already. great. All right. We'll come back to that in a second. Tonya, this is not the only direct cash assistance program that you've helped to amass resources for in the DC region. I think you said there were seven of them going on in different places, if I got that right. Eight? Actually, I was corrected earlier today. It's, it's about 14. We've okay. funded about 14 different efforts across the region that have a cash transfer component. And for with a, at the Community Foundation, you know, across the broad range of our partnerships with local government, this is actually totaling about $7 million in philanthropic resources that will be directed towards some, uh, some level of cash transfer program or another. And I want to ask about that. I mean, that's obviously a major strategic choice that you've made. Um, uh, George already spoke about the, the power that flexible funds provide. They provide to nonprofits. They certainly provide to individual families. Um, but there's another component that direct cash gives, which is a kind of uh, dignity and respect that we're showing to the recipients of the funds that they may actually be the expert here in what their family most needs. And I'm just curious about how you, the foundation thinks about the value of these in efforts. Absolutely. Um, you know, before the CARES Act was uh, passed and before uh, unemployment and the pandemic unemployment insurance kicked in, we knew for sure that we needed to get money in the hands of people. I mean, there just weren't enough organizations who were able to pivot quickly enough to respond to the immediate rent needs or the prescription needs or to support families and children who were transitioning from you know, daytime school to digital learning, that families needed to sort these kinds of things out for themselves. And so the best way to do that, to allow for, as, as George said, some level of independence was to put money in the hands of people, of workers directly. Um, we know that Americans uh, have less than $400 writ large in savings and that many uh, low income people have negative cash asset, assets. And so putting money in the hands of people so that they could have some, some discretion about how they were able to sort themselves out and sort their families out, we, 
we deemed it was the most appropriate uh, way to use resources. I'm incredibly pleased that, that philanthropy has come very far on this as well. Um, we've been working uh, around the table with many of our, our, our local partners just on strategy in general. And so it's not just the Community Foundation, but it's the Community Foundation and a broad range of our local philanthropic partners who, who made this decision to invest in this way. We started down this path in 2019 uh, with the federal shutdown and just had very little luck. I mean, the infrastructure wasn't in place, the, the practice wasn't in place. And I'm just amazed at how far we've come in about a 15 month period and really thinking this through and knowing that it is a viable option and solution for, uh, for philanthropy to invest directly with families and communities. So Mary, let's use this occasion for you to describe a little bit more. This is not just um, uh, cash assistance, um, but it's cash assistance enabled with some other resources. Do you want to describe a little bit about the different roles the different, and the different, slightly different models that the different nonprofits are playing? Yeah. And then I'm going to give you a second part to the question, which is talk a little bit about um, uh, how Urban is going to try to um, create some sort of evidence record from these uh, that might be helpful in other communities. Okay. Uh, help me remember the second half, but I'll okay, start with the first. <laughs> I'll start with the first, which is um, when you're talking about there is a groceries and, and dry goods uh, component to this. Uh, and that's being led up um, by uh, an, a really they're, all four of the nonprofit partners and in the initiative are, as you talked about, highly reputable organizations. And the first one is Martha's Table. Martha's Table uh, has a their joyful markets and a, a lot of food uh, distribution uh, missions as well as early childhood work they do. And really Martha's Table um, was kind of the flagship pilot for this entire effort because they right away back in March started putting out their own um, uh, discretionary resources to support the families enrolled in their early childhood program. So um, Kim Ford and her team have really led um, on that. Br building bridges across the river in Bridge Park uh, under the leadership of Scott Kratz and his team have played a major coordinating role. I mean, Scott has been there every step of the way, making sure the dots connect. Uh, George and his team at Bread for the City are, are the fiscal agent. As you can tell, George and his team have a lot of experience with people in deep poverty. They've been helping us connect to our cash distribution mechanism, which is the Family Independence Initiatives Up Together platform. And also George's folks are, are really helping us with the systemic barrier, helping the partnership think through the systemic barriers their lawyers are even coming to bat talking directly to families about is this going to threaten other pieces of what you get that you need to survive um and finally dion bussy reader's team at uh Fa the far southeast family strengthening collaborative has been doing incredible work um with service navigation because one of the things and again there's a very big systemic core to this whole thing where people can get as tonya talked about uh, relief from the CARES Act, unemployment insurance, but these families tend to be very marginalized from those sorts of services. So Far Southeast and their service navigators are helping people to connect these other, particularly the cash resources that are available. And because of the disparities we've been talking about, folks didn't get right away and some of them still haven't gotten them even yet. So George, a uh, two part question for you, Mary, we'll come back to the research evaluation later um, and what we hope to do, um, uh, but two parts. First is um, talk a little bit about some of the risks to the recipients, um, including of becoming in both the possibility of finding your way to eligibility to programs you already have through this, but potentially also um, of, of losing eligibility for other things and how you're handling that problem and this question of waivers. And then secondly, I want you to turn back to structural racism and whether there are elements of this program that can start to show us a path forward to beginning to target um, elements of structures that are um, inhibiting people's opportunity. Right. Well, both of those could you could spend an hour talking about Fair them, enough. Affect them, but, <laughs> uh, but when as it relates to the public benefits piece, you know, virtually everybody used, we see in our communities, whether they um, have, you know, work related income or not may be on some form of assistance, you know, minimally uh, the SNAP program or food stamps, as many people know, Medicaid recipients, Medicare, um, and, you know, and maybe Section 8, um, you know, 
affordable housing subsidies, and all of them have tend to have means tests that could get affected by assets. In fact, you know, to, to marry the two questions you ask, one of the sort of things that always drives me nuts is that in a country where we, we say we want people to, you know, get themselves out of poverty, our rules essentially force you to stay in poverty to receive public benefits. You literally, by rule, can't save money, you can't have assets. And so we, we, you have to work around those barriers, you know, look at the most that some of the programs of security will allow for less than $2,000 of assets. And we all know that you're not going to get a financial footing if you've got less than $2,000 and that's the max you can. So, so trying to make the case that that's illogical, uh, but oppressive. And one of the things about systemic racism is that it, it looks like there's not somebody who's in charge of driving those kinds of systems. But what I've said to people consistently is if you're in leadership, it's your responsibility to understand. It isn't hard to know when your programs are going to cut negatively against people of color. In fact, if they tend to be punitive, you need to know they're going to be more punitive on people of color because they're already too often disproportionately disadvantaged. So, so you know, you've got those pieces. So on the one hand, we're talking to people, we're providing them legal help, we're, we're being pragmatic about, hey, you got to really think about whether your food stamps are going to get reduced. That tends to be the least onerous thing. You know, you can get your food stamps reduced, but you can go back and reapply and say, my income is down. And so, but again, as I talked earlier, the other end of the continuum is if you lose your Medicare and then a month later you have some catastrophic injury, you know, $550,000 medical expense, uh, you know, it, it's for people who already have low incomes, it could just sort of uh, be, you know, sparrow people into deeper, what, what many people call extreme poverty. So we felt that we had an obligation to make sure that folks understood that those were the risks. And the other, you know, on the other hand, this was going to provide, we do believe it's going to provide people a chance to make some decisions, to make some investments that, that, that have a potential to give them a foothold out of poverty. And to, you know, uh, one of the things I always say about these initiatives, you know, they happen across the country. It happens to some degree sort of accidentally where people have gotten influx, communities got influx of money. And what they always demonstrate is that all of these social indices, kids do better in school, healthcare results improve, people are more employed when they have resources. You know, it's just hard to be successful starting with zero uh, or negative resources, as, as Tonya said earlier. So, so yes, we, we really focus on the impact it can have and, the, and really on fire about what can happen for these families. But we are trying to be really responsible and supportive of them understanding what the risks are. And at the end of the day, Hopefully we can get policymakers and other uh, gatekeepers in these systems that people interface with to really think about how do I make my system, to make your system anti-racist, you have to make them, as opposed to being gatekeeping, they need to be gateways for people, gateways to access, gateways to success. Right now, many of the systems are set up as gatekeeping systems, and so they prevent you from succeeding because they have rules that prohibit this and prohibit that, prohibit savings, and all the other things that we all know uh, it takes to be, you know, um, upwardly mobile financially. Um, so, Tonya, um, you mentioned the other uh, 14 programs, and there are lots of requests to know which ones they are. So we're going to ask you to provide that offline, and we will put right. that up on our website later. Um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you're thinking with all of these. I mean, this moment when it was patently clear that there was this you know, almost um, magic wand waved and income for so many low income people just disappeared was a uniquely compelling moment to make the case for direct cash assistance. Um, but there is a discussion, not just about emergency cash assistance, but whether or not some of the anti-poverty programs that uh, we run might be redesigned in different ways. And that's, there's a lot of controversy and debate, um, although George points out there's also, I'm gonna ask Mary to, uh, describe a little bit more about the research record that's out there in a minute. So I'm just curious how you're thinking about that this period and maybe what are the sort of longer term opportunities for changing the conversation? Great, thanks. So there, there are lots of hopes that we're hoping will we expect to come out of this, but I'll, I'll boil them down to three. One, that we can uh, begin to trust people, trust especially low income people, typically black and brown people when it comes to their ability and need and desire and capacity to make important decisions about their lives and the lives of their families. 
and to understand that, because uh, typically the thing that comes up often in our, in our conversations with philanthropists and with uh, philanthropy is, you know, hey, they need financial literacy training. You know, and I, and I often say, and I say it, you know, a bit jokingly, you know, you can't teach someone how to manage to, you know, manage with zero. Like we, we know that wages have not kept up pace with cost of living. You can't do a course to teach how to, how to adjust or correct for that. Anyway, trust people to be able to make decisions for, for themselves about, about their needs. And people need more money. Like we need more money until the cost of rent goes down. Um, secondly, uh, my hope is that we can inform policy shifts and policy decisions. You know, if we know that there is a benefits clip, then what is it that we can do uh, so that people can begin to amass assets, so they can begin to make final, or have the time and space to make, you know, different decisions about their, their finances or their, or their livelihoods or their lives. Um, and that requires some changes in, in, in the policy clift um, uh, uh, positioning so that it does not negatively impact a family to be able to receive additional resources. And then the third, um, you know, hope for this is just a, really, a real focus on, uh, on good jobs. You know, one of my favorite quotes is a quote from Martin Luther King that says, philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice, which make philanthropy necessary. You know, my hope is that we'll begin to focus on jobs that have, that pay a living wage, that have, you know, benefits, including, you know, paid sick leave, um, uh, health insurance, you know, the, the kinds of things that can help propel uh, people, individuals and families to the, to the, to the middle class. Right. So Mary, uh, two questions. One, a very specific one from the audience, if you could. Um, just quickly describe the ways in which either universally or maybe each organization differently is selecting the participants in the program, because obviously uh, this is only a tiny fraction of those who are eligible for the need. And then I'll come bring you back to this other question, um, which is what are the kind of products that we're going to uh, be producing and how might that be helpful to other communities that are thinking about these sure. issues or the policymakers trying to understand these interactions? Yeah. Well, you know, the sampling, as we as researchers discuss, is interesting for this um, study that we're doing on Thrive, because each of the organizations are bringing in very different populations of people, but there are two parameters that govern the entire recruitment process going on. We've enrolled about, they've enrolled about 100 people so far, um, and we're working up to the 500. So basically, the two Overarching parameters are folks have to be under 50% um, of annual median income, uh, which in the DC region is a very low wage, very low income level to be at. Uh, Prior to the beginning of the COVID yes, crisis, right? Exactly. Yeah. And they need to also have a pre existing relationship with their nonprofits because each nonprofit is recruiting from their uh, base of participants. So one of the more poignant things that has happened already from, from that we've heard is that there's a lot of folks, word of mouth is getting around. There's a lot of folks who are in desperate circumstances and they're calling uh, and really uh, coming to the nonprofit saying, can I get in this? I need it too. And so unfortunately, there's, you're right, Sarah, there's no way that 500 is all the folks who need it. Luckily with the systemic piece, I think this project will in fact help uh, George talked about the, the Medicaid work that's being done now. That's actually a big systemic barrier, and we know we're pushing on an open door with district government to get that for some relief there. Um, and quickly, 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 uh, goals of the evaluation and the, uh, as you were saying, monthly memos back to the participants. Yeah, well, the goals of the evaluation are we're going to be looking at process and um, impact outcomes. It's not a, a random control trial. So what are the outcomes will be largely derived through surveys of participants, qualitative data. We're going to have a great deal of administrative data. My um, colleagues, uh, Peter Tatian and Elaine Mogg are co-PIs with me on this project, and they are going to help with a lot of that kind of contextual data because at the end of the day, we know that cash transfers in an emergency situation help stabilize people. We've seen lots of evidence for that. We're also looking to find out 
did we sustain, did we preserve mo economic security mobility and boost that? And again, George was talking about that. Um, did something happen for these families where they got back on their feet faster and kept going higher in their work with the nonprofits in the first place? So I'm, uh, that's terrific, Mary. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, Tonya and George to kind of bring us out, if you will, with some closing thoughts. It's hard to imagine at a moment um, which is as tragic as this one is, um, uh, silver linings or opportunities. But I'd love each of you to share something. Uh, Tonya, you started to talk about your, your three hopes. Um, uh, close us out with a thought about um, what maybe could we could make better as a result of this work? So Tonya and then George, please. Sure. So um, you know, I'll, I'll say that if there is a silver lining in any of this, it, it is and has been the way that the community has uh, come together to respond to the broad range of, uh, of families who are in need. Um, you know, my my hope again is that we will you know sort of look to the future so that the margins aren't so thin for people um, in in our community and across the country. Um, but while they are, uh, my, my 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 appeal is that uh, philanthropy donors investors will continue to support this important work uh, across the region, actually and across the country, because families are going to need it. We're just sort of in the in the in the in a swing position now, and moving out of phase one of COVID and moving into a new phase where families will be at home um, with their kids, trying to figure out how they teach them and how they keep a roof over their heads, and they're going to need more support from uh, from the community and not uh, and not less. And so uh, my my ask is that we continue to lean in to pro pro provide these various forms of support and uh, and not step away at this critical moment in time. George? Well, at the one end, I believe that if we can get some waivers, like the ones we talked about earlier at the local government level, uh, minimally, these kinds of uh, private philanthropy can step in easier to make these kind of funds uh, available. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the most sustainable model, but it certainly would be interesting if, if, the, if the public sector was willing to even at least play that role and allow empowering the sort of the you know, philanthropic sector to be able to at least provide this direct support without risking everything for people in their, in their social economic stability. But at the other extreme, my, the real vision is that, particularly in this city, Washington, D.C., that we get public leaders to say that they're committed to ending poverty, to ending race-based social economic disparities. And I don't think that there's any question, but part of the formula to doing that is making sure that families are much more economic secure today than they are so that their family, their children and their grandchildren one day won't have to repeat uh, the cycle of poverty that, that we've experienced in DC for the, the, the so for umpteen de decades. So, you know, let's, let's think about macro, let's end poverty altogether. Here's a way to do it, social economic security, but minimally, let's sort of re remove those barriers that prevent uh, nonprofits and the philanthropic sector from doing more progressive things to help families, because we know this really helps. And the last thing for the larger community to know is, and this, I, you know, people know this better than I do, economists know this, is that you're talking about people who are going to be consumers, that it is in the best interest of the economy to get dollars into the hands of people who have to use it to pay rent, to pay back rent, and to feed children, and who have real needs that can really infuse a kind of economic boost to the businesses that, uh, you know, that uh, are on the other side of the equation. Um, well, I'll, although we are an independent research organization, I think I can say what maybe you can't each, which is those who are excited by this can also think about supporting the nonprofits that are delivering, or if you have uh, um, a modest level of means, the Community Foundation is a wonderful vehicle also for you to channel your investments. Um, so I encourage people to think about that as well. I just today um, made a contribution to Bread for the City, and I hope others will consider that as well. Um, let me just say uh, um, thank you to our partners. Um, thank you to Mary and her team for the work we're doing here. This is a really exciting uh, uh, project and body of work, and we look forward to coming back together and talking about it again soon when we uh, have lessons to share uh, with others. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and check back in uh, for the next uh, Evidence to Action series. Be well and be safe.
Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.